Uh, welcome, everybody. This is a, an adult ed program about Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, I believe this is our fourth Israel program over the last two years. We had um, uh, Rabbi Neil Gold come to, well, he didn't come. He was online speaking to us last year. And Mark Hager did a, a program on Israel technology. Um, this year, Mark did another one about Israel technology. And then this one's a little different. Like I said, Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, the way we'll do this, that when Mark allows for questions, you'll come up and talk on the, uh, the lavalier. And um, I want to thank Cheryl Carmel for coming to set up because Mark is at home with, you probably heard, um, with a, a pretty bad cold. So. Um, but he really worked very hard in preparing this and wanted to, to share it with you. So I want to welcome everyone. And um, this is also this is also the 75th, this year is the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel. So I think it's appropriate that we do some Israel programs. So um, at that point, Mark, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm um... I'm disappointed that I'm I'm not in the sanctuary with with people, um, but uh, thankfully with Zoom I'm I'm able to do this, and I will try to mute myself if I have to cough, and we'll 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 do we'll do the best we can. So I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to be looking at Israel and Palestinians, and. A couple of important things on this slide. One is it's an introduction because they wouldn't give me 15 hours to do this talk. So this is an introduction. And secondly, it's a complicated topic. And, and, and that'll be mentioned several times going forward. Okay, so can't help it. I'm an engineer. I start with chapter zero and we'll take a look at some basic facts. And this is the most important slide that I'm going to be presenting today, okay? Um, always be suspicious when you see facts about Israel, okay? So uh, hopefully I'm not going to surprise anyone when I say that if you see something about Israel on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, that doesn't guarantee that it's true. Um, and the same goes for New York Times or CNN or, or Fox News or anyone else. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Always be suspicious. I'm going to give you a lot of facts today about Israel. Be suspicious. I've checked my facts carefully, but you should follow this rule always. If they say something about Israel relating to international law, be doubly suspicious. And we'll, we'll hear more about that in this talk. Okay, the, the right-hand side of this chart is, is, is equally important. You have to know when is criticism of Israel a valid criticism? It may be right or wrong, but it's a legitimate criticism. Or when is it anti-Semitism? And I, I don't like using anti-Semitism as much because uh, some people get confused by it. So I, I talk about Jew hatred. When is it Jew hatred? This is the rule that I think works the best. And it, it's I give credit to Natan Sharansky. Uh, if you don't know who Sharansky is, it would be good to look him up. Uh, he was a physicist in Russia who was uh, jailed, put in the gulag because he was Jewish during the the era where Jews were not allowed to leave, but they were treated very badly by Russia. He eventually came to Israel and became a politician in Israel, and he's still very active. And he came up with a scheme of the three Ds. He says, basically, if you do even one of these three things, that's not legitimate criticism. So delegitimization, so what does that mean? That means if you believe that there should be no countries in the world. We, sh we should all be one giant country. Well, that, that's a, an unusual point of view, but it's a point of view. But if you believe all the countries in the world should exist, but Israel shouldn't, that's delegitimization. 
right? Demonization, what is that? I mean, if you believe that Israel tries as hard as it can to kill Palestinian babies, that's demonization. That it, it, there's, there's no evidence for anything like that. And it's just, it's just um, uh, Jew hatred. And double standards, we'll see many, many double standards. Uh, you know, a simple one as an example would be that countries have the right to defend themselves against attack, but when rockets are fired from Gaza, Israel has to do nothing. That would be a double standard because certainly if Canada fired rockets on the United States, we would do something. All right, so let me give you a timeline. These are some key dates that are pretty important. The first is prior and during World War I, the entire region was part of the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Empire, along with Germany, lost World War I, and the British and French divided up the region. Uh, and what they decided to do was to create various mandates, they were called, which would then be turned over to the indigenous people to become countries. And all of the countries in the Middle East were formed this way. And the last one to be formed was the British Mandate for Palestine, which was promised to the Jews because they're the indigenous people of that region. And that, that finally happened in 1948 when the British left and Israel declared independence. And immediately thereafter, the Arab armies attacked and there was a big war. And in 1949, an armistice was declared. And, uh, and, and during that time, Jordan captured East Jerusalem, they captured the West Bank, Egypt captured Gaza, and a green line was drawn on a map to say this is the armistice line. Israeli soldiers stay on one side of the line, Arab soldiers stay on the other side of the line. That's the green line. In 1967, again, the Arabs tried to eliminate Israel, and Israel retakes the land that was lost in 49, East Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza, plus more, including uh, the Sinai. 1973, the Arabs once again attack and try to destroy Israel in the famous Yom Kippur War. And this is the last major war. And then what happens is various countries are beginning to believe that it's not so easy to destroy Israel by attack. So let's create a peace treaty and get some of the land back that was taken from us. So 1979, Israel-Egypt peace treaty. 93 was the start of, a, of two Oslo Accords, which was a framework for how to reach peace between Israel and Palestine. And 1994, Jordan signs a peace treaty with Israel. So these are, these are like key dates you know, I ex don't expect you to have it memorized, but you get the flow of what happened. And now we come to a couple of maps. And even which map you decide to look at kind of tells you a bit of a story of how you may be thinking of things. So, so if you look on the right, right, you can see the Jordan River is what separates what I, what's labeled their West Bank from the country of Jordan. So you have Jordan River flowing into the Dead Sea. And why is it called West Bank? Because it's on the West Bank of the Jordan River. Uh, you look at that map and there's kind of a shading inside that West Bank area. And it's very complicated. From the Oslo Accords, the area was divided up into area A, B, and C. And I don't have time to really explore that very much. but um, but let me at least say that it's a complicated series of uh, agreements going on inside that West Bank. And in Area A, 90% of the Palestinians live, and they totally govern themselves in those towns. But if you look at this map on the right, you can see, you know, if you think in terms of David and Goliath, uh, you know, uh, maybe Israel's Goliath here, because they certainly seem to be in control of things. 
But if you look at the map on the left side, now instead of thinking of a, uh, of a Palestinian Israeli conflict, you think of a, an Arab Israeli conflict, you know, you can barely see is, oops, sorry, didn't mean that. You can barely see Israel next in between Jordan and Egypt there, a little green. And the orange is the Arab world. Clearly, the Arab world is Goliath and Israel's David. And that doesn't even include all the Muslim countries in the area that are not Arab countries like Turkey and Iran. All right, so I'm going to go through a couple of definitions next. The 1967 borders, you'll hear about them quite a bit on the news. Um, interesting terminology representing the green line that I've talked about before, uh, which was the, uh, and the only thing wrong with the term is they weren't from 1967, they were from 1949, and they weren't borders, they were armistice lines. Why were they not borders? Because the Arab country said, no, those are not borders. Our goal is to wipe out Israel, and we will not recognize Israel within any borders. So anyway, that's the green line, uh, and you'll hear it as 1967 borders, which is, like I said, really 1949 armistice line. Who are the Palestinians? These are the, the Arab residents of pre-1948 Israel and their descendants. But, but I don't include Arab Israeli citizens in this group, right? They, we, we'll call them Israeli Arabs, uh, but we're not going to include them as Palestinians. And I think most, most Israelis, including the Israeli Arabs, would say they're not Palestinians. The Oslo Accords set up a government, a recognized government, which is the Palestinian Authority, Israel recognizes, so when you see PA in this talk, it's not Pennsylvania, it's Palestinian Authority. Um, the president of the Palestinian Authority is Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he's currently in the 19th year of his four-year term, so not quite a democracy there. Um, and the West Bank we've talked about is the western side of the Jordan River, and the name that it had before it was referred to as the West Bank in uh, 1967 uh, was Judea and Samaria. And you'll hear most Israelis refer to th that same area that most people, most Westerners call the West Bank. Most Israelis will call it Judea and Samaria, which is a historic name. So, I've been through a lot of stuff so far. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I go to the next chart? Okay, so, so here are the topics I'm gonna to be talking about. Is Palestine a state? When a state, I don't mean like New Jersey. I mean, is it a country, uh, a nation, a nation state? Those are all the same things as I referred to uh, state. Uh, is, is Palestine a state? Very interesting topic, you'll see. Uh, are the West Bank and Gaza occupied territories? We'll talk about what that means. Uh, what are the settlements and are they illegal? What is apartheid? Is Israel an apartheid state? So these are, these are all topics you hear about in the news. And of course, uh, a couple of years ago, when the COVID vaccine came out, it was a big topic. Is Israel responsible for vaccinating the Palestinians? All right, chapter one, is Palestine a state? So I brought with me uh, my friend, Danny Ayalan, who was ambassador from Israel to the United States from 2002 to 2006. And He's gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson. Palestine. Let's be accurate about what it means. Palestine was the Greco-Roman name for a region along the Mediterranean Sea, which included Judea, Samaria, and areas which are today in Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. But like Antarctica, the Amazons, or Sahara, naming a place doesn't create a nation of Antarcticans or Saharans. 
In the year 135 AC, the name of the region became the official name of one of the provinces of the Roman Empire in a failed attempt to obliterate the connection between the Jewish people and Judea, the land they had inhabited since roughly the 13th century BC, almost 1500 years before. Only 500 years later in the 7th century AC, migrant Arabs occupied areas of the region for the first time. But they never ever defined or created a state or country there. Think about it. Have you ever heard of a Palestinian ruler or of the Kingdom of Palestine? Can anyone honestly name one historical Palestinian figure from before the age of television? That's because, as a national entity, they never existed. Okay, so this is not talking about whether they should exist or they do exist today. It's, it's a history lesson, and I think knowing the history is, is important. So I'm going to give you a little more history because what most people don't remember is before Israeli independence in 1948, Palestinian usually meant Zionist Jew, usually. So for example, there was a newspaper called the Palestine Bulletin, and that was a Jewish newspaper formed in 1925 for business reasons. They became the Palestine Post in 1933, but you can see by the year 1950, it was clear that Palestinian was an Arab designator and the paper was renamed the Jerusalem Post in 1950, uh, which you can still look at the, you know, today uh, online, jpost.com. Well, how about the Arabs? Did they call themselves Palestinian? Okay, well, in... 1919, they had the first Palestine Arab Congress, and, and they issued a proclamation that says, we consider Palestine nothing but uh, a part of Arab Syria. But by the next year, in the third Palestine Arab Congress, we're starting to see the beginning of Palestinian nationalism. So history is good to know. It's good to know history. Okay. Um, next, the here's some some evidence that Palestine today is is a government is is a country is a state. Of the 193 members of the United Nations, 72 percent of them say that Palestine is a state. It's almost as many as say that Israel is a state. Only 165 of the 193 will recognize the existence of Israel. So, you know, of course, countries like uh, uh, Iran and Syria and several others do not, okay? The United States and Israel do not recognize the state of Palestine. Next, is Palestine a UN member? Well, the Palestinian Authority applied for membership in 2011. It's actually a violation of the Oslo Accords. They're not allowed to, according to the framework agreement, they have to negotiate directly with Israel, not third parties, but they did that. And the UN said, no, you can't be a member, but you are a quote, non-member, observer state status. And furthermore, in all the documents of the United Nations from this point forward, we will refer to Palestine as state of Palestine. So that happened in 2012. Why did they do that? Because the Palestinian Authority wants to bring Israel to the International Criminal Court, and only a country is allowed to uh, start an investigation through that court. Kind of a kind of a strange situation. Okay, let's take another look at it. They have a government in Palestine. Now I've talked about it a few times already, the Palestinian Authority. It has a civil service, it has a security force, it has diplomats, embassies around the world. Their diplomats have diplomatic immunity. Uh, they claim sovereign immunity 
uh, that sometimes works in U.S. courts, sometimes not. That means that uh, you can't sue the country. Uh, they get billions of dollars in foreign aid, and they have their own central bank. Really starting to feel like a country. Okay, if you look at their society, same thing. They have their own schools. They have their own TV stations. If you want to go to one of their websites, you don't use the .il you would for an Israeli website. You use .ps. If you want to call them on the phone, you don't use the Israeli country calling code of 972. They have their own calling code, 970. All of this makes it look like Palestine definitely is a country today. But maybe not. And the one thing that they don't have that all countries have is recognized borders. Okay, sometimes you'll hear Palestinian leaders talk about uh, they claim the river to the sea or the slogan from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And once again, I show you the map to remind you the river, Jordan River there, the sea is that Mediterranean Sea on the left of the map. River to the sea means no Israel. So they claim sometimes their border is everything. Sometimes they say their border is the 1967 borders, which we've talked about before or not from 1967 and not borders. So, so it's not clear what their borders are. Uh, certainly they don't control the land within any recognized borders. Okay. Second thing is they say sometimes, especially when they're talking to a Western audience, that they want a two-state solution. Well, Israel's already a state. If Palestine's already a state, then they already have a two-state solution. So clearly, Palestine's not yet a state. And they also claim that they are occupied territory, and they've always been occupied, so that clearly they can't be a state. So, so there's, there's good reason to think Palestine's a state. There's good reason to think it's not a state. So is Palestine a state? The answer is, it's complicated. I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. And that's that's the end of my first chapter. Anyone have any questions about this topic of is Palestine a state? No? Okay, then I'm going to continue. Chapter two, is Palestine occupied territory? And remember at the beginning, I told you be doubly suspicious when you hear legal talk, international law. So here's, here's my expert on international law, Eugene Kantorovich. Uh, he used to be at Northwestern University. Now he's at George Mason University and he's gonna address this issue. How many times have you heard that Israel occupies the West Bank? Probably more times than you can count. But have you ever asked yourself whether it's true or even what it means? Let's do so now in the most objective way possible. That is, in the way that all territorial questions everywhere else in the world are resolved. To do this, we must look at the law. But first, we need a little history. Up until 100 years ago, the areas now called Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and all the countries around them were part of the Ottoman Empire which ruled over a vast area and many peoples. Neither the Jews nor those Arabs we now call Palestinians had a state, though the Jews had a nationalist movement calling for one. Everything changed after World War I. The Ottomans fought on the losing side with Germany. By the end of the war in 1918, their empire had disintegrated, leaving the British and French in control of much of its territory. In earlier times, the victors would likely have kept this land as colonies for themselves but there was a new spirit of democracy in the air. The Allies, including the British, French, and Americans, agreed that the former Ottoman lands should be allowed to become independent nation states. After the war, the nations of the world created the League of Nations, a precursor to the United Nations. Meeting in San Remo, Italy in 1920, they set up what was known as the Mandate System. The colonies of the defeated powers, Germany and the Ottoman Empire, were converted into distinct geopolitical entities, which became the countries now known as Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. None of this is controversial. There was one other mandate issued, the mandate for Palestine. Now, Palestine was merely a geographic label, 
the name the Romans gave the Jewish kingdom of Judea after they conquered it. There was nothing exclusively Arab about it. The mandate provided that Palestine would become a national home for the Jewish people. There was a simple reason for this. The League recognized that Jews were the indigenous people of the area. All the mandatory territories in the Middle East transitioned to statehood in the 1930s and 40s, with Israel the last to do so, declaring independence in May 1948. Now we get to the legal stuff. What were the borders of the State of Israel when it declared independence? International law has a simple and universally applicable rule for determining borders of new countries. It's called the Uti Procedetus Juris Principle. Lawyers love Latin phrases. The rule provides that when a new country is created, its borders match the borders of the previous geopolitical entity in that territory. For example, the borders of Ukraine, Latvia, and Azerbaijan are exactly what they were when they were parts of the Soviet Union. Other considerations, such as demographics, are not taken into account, because without a simple, easily applied rule, a new country's borders would never be settled, a recipe for permanent conflict. Applying this rule to Israel means that it had sovereign claims to all of Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and Gaza, because those were its borders according to the Mandate of Palestine. To be sure, the United Nations proposed a resolution in 1947 with different borders and a much smaller area for a Jewish state. But that resolution was a non-binding recommendation, nothing more. It did not have the force of law. We know what happened next. Upon declaring independence, Israel was immediately invaded by five Arab armies seeking to destroy it. Israel survived, but Jordan managed to seize parts of Jerusalem, as well as Judea and Samaria, which it dubbed the West Bank. All the Jews living in these areas were expelled, or to use the contemporary term, ethnically cleansed. Here, we need to introduce another key principle of international law. A war of aggression cannot be used to change another country's borders. Israel and Jordan signed an armistice agreement in 1949, an agreement to temporarily stop fighting. This truce had no legal effect on borders. When Israel liberated these territories in 1967 during the Six-Day War, it was retaking its own land. You can't occupy land that belongs to you. So where are we now? In 1994, the Palestinian Authority was established as part of the Oslo Accords. Israel didn't have to agree to this, but it did. While not being a sovereign state, the PA operates independently of Israel. The PA, not Israel, governs the lives of Palestinians living in the West Bank. Israel has offered the Palestinians a fully independent state on several occasions. Each time, the Palestinians have rejected the offer, something no other national independence movement in modern times has done. Whether or not it makes sense for Israel to renew such offers is an open question, but it's under no legal obligation to do so. Okay, so, Basically, that, that video is talking about international law, and it warns you that the term occupation is a concept in international law that doesn't apply in this case, because you can't occupy your own land. It does not say, how do the Palestinians feel when they're in one of the Palestinian towns in the West Bank and Israeli soldiers come through, they might very well feel like they're occupied. It doesn't say what should happen going forward. It's just saying, if you claim that Israel is occupying according to international law and it has to follow the conventions of occupation, that's not exactly that's not correct. That, that's what this, this section was about, international law, which remember I said, be doubly suspicious. Okay. And I think that's all I had on this section is the, oh, so is the West Bank occupied territory? No, it's not. Israel's the only country that has a legal claim, but it is complicated. It is complicated. I want to talk about Gaza relative to occupation. So let me let me do that and then I'll take questions. Okay. 
Israel left Gaza in 2005. It was an attempt to say, hey, let's leave. We'll take all the Israelis, all the Jews with us. Even We'll even dig up the graves from the Jewish cemeteries and we'll move them outside of Gaza. They removed everything in 2005. And they were hoping that they could live peaceably with the Palestinians in Gaza. However, Hamas, the terrorist organization, overthrew the Palestinian Authority in Gaza in 2007. When that happened, Israel imposed a naval blockade. A naval blockade is a legal response to a belligerent action from a foreign power. There have been many, many naval blockades through history, and there are many naval blockades in place today. This is not the only one. However, this concept that Gaza is occupied because Israel has a naval blockade, that's, this is a rule that only applies to Israel. There never has there been such a rule. So, so for example, uh, I, you know, if we go back in history, a very famous naval blockade was in 1962, John F. Kennedy was president. Uh, the Russians were moving, the Soviets were moving missiles into Cuba. So the United States put a naval blockade around Cuba. Nobody suggested the United States was occupying Cuba. That's not what a naval blockade is. So, so the answer is, is Gaza occupied territory? This one is very clear cut, not complicated. No. Okay, any any questions before I go to the next topic? No questions today on any topic so far. Okay. Chapter three. Our, yeah, go ahead, you got a question, good. Yes. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes, yes. Hi, it's Andrew Benowitz. Um, I have a question about your the legal expert whose video yes. you showed. Yes. Uh, I, I think that you're right when you say that we should be very skeptical when we see words about legal international law or things like that. Um, the legal expert that you showed there was showing one very um, distinct point of view. And yes. I couldn't help but notice that it was a video from Prager U, who is, I mean, it's an organization that's very well known for sort of extreme right wing views. It is kind of evangelical points of view. Sometimes. And so I think it's I, fair. I'm, to not, I'm not endorsing. No, no, I understand. Go My ahead. point yeah. is, is there are there other legal experts who maybe have a different point of view on this? I have not heard anybody refute the idea of the borders of Israel when it declared independence contained the West Bank and Gaza. I've never heard any experts say that's not true. It would be hard to do that because the borders of the British mandate were very well-defined and well-known. And this principle of UT, uh, I don't do well at Latin terms, UT, what, whatever, whatever they called it, uh, this principle of your borders are the borders of the administrative region that it was before, that is a very well-known situation. So that, for example, when Russia took over Crimea, you know, there, there's nobody outside of Russia who said, well, Crimea is ethnically Russian, so it should belong to Russia. No, because that well, wasn't. Mark, sorry, orders, this, yeah. this, this may not be the, the time to get into this. All, all yeah. I'm saying here is that clearly there are lots of people. I mean, that was one point of view. I think there's yes, lots of people yes. who may not agree with that point of view or may have a different point of view. Yes. In uh, the United States. Yes. Probably probably also in Israel, and certainly in other parts of the world. Yes, definitely true. Definitely true. But but to answer your question, um, the, the only reason I've ever heard why somebody says that the West Bank is occupied is because it is occupied. 
I, I've never heard anybody referring to any international law principles to justify it. And I probably would have heard it because uh, search engines are very, very good at funneling stuff to me um, that is uh, anti-Israel. I get a lot of it. So uh, again, it doesn't tell you what should happen going forward. It just says, don't use certain principles that may not be correct. Yeah, this this is Rabbi Lazar. I just wanted to uh, to say that you know this is an excellent illustration of why it's important to not just take whatever you read or hear or see as oh that's the case, right? Mr. Benowitz made a really great point, and and uh, Mr. Hager is going to be sharing some uh, some resources later about websites and and places where they really do a good job at presenting kind of translations of reports and things so you can see what different people are saying in different languages in different places just because you read something doesn't necessarily mean it's true anybody who's ever heard me talk about israel at all has always heard me say change the channel watch more than one station read more than one paper don't get your news from only one source you're going to be wrong on on almost every count if that's what you do You've got to hear what different people are saying. And we have a lot of, and again, the, the, this is a presentation from, you know, sharing certain perspectives and uh, based on what is, what we, we know to be as true as, as, as uh, you know, as Mr. Hager has from the information he's gathered, we're also going to, he's also going to provide information and opportunities for each of us to kind of do some research on our own and find out ways of of fact checking and and other places. So uh, really be careful about this stuff. Don't just take uh, any one particular viewpoint as fact, and make sure that you watch more than one station, read more than one paper, and uh, and and do your do your own due diligence to kind of see what people are saying because it's so important. I say that when I talk about Israel all the time, and not just Israel, but specifically Israel. Yeah, and. I would say, uh, actually, I uh, we we'll we'll talk at the end about other resources uh, if you like. I, I I don't have it in in the presentation, but um, but I I did tell people right from the beginning. That's that's the key point is is be suspicious, draw your own conclusions. I think that the statements that Eugene Kondrovich and Eugene Kondrovich is pretty far to the right. I'm I'm not denying that but i think that his facts are correct you know where he would go with it i'm not going to talk about today um because i i just want to go through some background facts okay and 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 i think the situation is going to get even more confusing as i go on to the next topic are the settlements illegal so first what are the settlements okay Towns and villages in the West Bank where Jews live. Those are the settlements. Are Arabs allowed to live in the settlement? Yes, there aren't too many Arabs that live in a Jewish settlement, but they're allowed to live there. When an Arab lives in the same house, uh, you know, or the next door house to a Jew in, in a settlement, the Arabs are not called settlers. The Jews are. Makes no sense to me. Okay. Does Israel deport or transfer Jews? No, the Jews and possibly some Arabs who buy houses in the West Bank in areas uh, where the Oslo Accord says Jews are allowed to live. They buy houses. If they want to live there, they live there. Israel doesn't transfer Jews into that area. Uh, that's why they're called settlements and they're not called deportation centers or transfer centers. Does the Fourth Geneva Convention apply? What is the Fourth Geneva? There are many different uh, international conventions uh, that are basically treaties among many nations. The Fourth Geneva Convention is what happens when you occupy a territory. And, and the answer is no, because we've already heard in, in this point of view that the West Bank is not occupied. Nevertheless, Israel does observe those conventions by their choice. So um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring back Eugene Kantorovich to talk about the international law relating to settlements. So again, not talking about whether it's good or bad for the Jews to live on the other side of the green line, 
But what does the law say? The question of the legality of Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria is central to all discussions of the Israeli-Arab conflict. And unlike pretty much every other geopolitical conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict is, even in popular discussions, almost invariably framed in legal terms. So when we hear, for example, about the uh, Turkish-Cypriot conflict, which is not often, but uh, you know, on the news they'll say, Turkish presence in northern Cyprus. But they won't say which is illegal or which is considered illegal. Uh, Russia's occupation of Crimea without any legal characterization. And on the other hand, invariably, any discussion of the Israeli presence in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, is coupled with a legal characterization. Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which are illegal under international law. And as a result, the legal issues are central here. However, in these discussions of the legal, of the legal, issue, of, of the legal issues, it's never said, so when you, when you read NP, uh, the New York Times, when you listen to NPR, Israeli settlements which are against international law. What you don't hear is an explanation of which international law is it against. Which international law is it against? S which you know, is not a very Jewish way. If you're trying to convince a Jew of a, of a proposition in Jewish law, you have to tell them, where do you find this? Where, where, where is this brought down in halacha? So they don't tell us where it's brought down. They don't tell us where it's brought down. And I'm going to sort of skip to the end and then backtrack a little bit. The entire discussion of the legality of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria is premised on just a few words in a completely obscure provision of a very specialized treaty, words which have never been interpreted or applied to any other country, in one particular treaty which does not even apply to Israel for various reasons. And it's the, the, the relevant sentence, what do people mean when they say settlements are illegal? First of all, what they really mean, what they really mean, is that Israel is required by some principle of international justice to maintain Judea and Samaria as a Jew-free zone, indefinitely, until the Palestinians agree to take it off their hands and maintain it as a Jew-free zone themselves. But pending that, pending that, Israel is obligated to ensure that the areas from which Jordan expelled the Jews in 1949 remain depopulated of Jews indefinitely. And that is a fairly shocking proposition when put in those terms. That's why people want to talk about it as the legality of settlements. Because when it's translated into what it means, that Israel must maintain a Jew-free zone, it doesn't sound as nice. That's why the legal rhetoric is important. Uh, that's why it's important to put it in those words. And it's important to say at the outset, the notion that a country, whether it be an occupying power or not, even assuming it's an occupying power, is required by law to keep a certain territory under its control, free of its own citizens, is not an idea, that is not something that has ever been asked of any country in the world. It is not something that any country has been asked to do. It is not something that any country has done. And it is not something any country has been faulted for failing to do. It's an unprecedented demand. Now, in the case of Israel, the, the demand is said to arise from Article 49.6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. I don't know if that helps you a lot. The, the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's a treaty. Right? So we have to ask whether the treaty applies, what it means. Article 49.6 says the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population 
to the territory that it occupies. That's the whole, that's the whole deal. And as I talked about a moment ago, the is, Israel does not deport or transfer anybody into the territories. So kind of a harsh video. Um, you know, it, it, does he have a good point? It doesn't tell you whether it's good for a long-term solution to have Jews living on the other side of the green line or not. My own personal opinion is I, I don't see how you can make peace with a Palestinian state if the Palestinian state believes that Jews are, are, are such a people that we can't have even a single Jew living among us. How, how can they be your peaceful neighbor? So, so I, have, I have some, um, some thoughts in, in that area, but just in terms of international law, I, I think it's important to understand what does the law say? Hey, Mark, it's Andrew again. Do you mind yeah, if yeah, I... Yeah. Sure, sure, go ahead. One of, that, one of the things that struck me about that video was the word Jew-free state, not Israeli free state. So oh, yeah. are all of the settlers always Jews? Are there non-Jewish settlers in those regions? Yeah. And I think actually this speaks to one of the fundamental difficulties and complexities in this is that even though Israel was created as an explicitly Jewish state, right? Mm -hmm. There are lots of non-Jews who live in Israel who are right. Israeli citizens, right. but a lot of the discussion is specifically around Jews, not okay. Israelis. Exactly. Um, yeah, the Palestinians don't don't have any problems for an Arab living inside of one of the settlements, and they don't call the Arab living there a settler. They, they only object to Jews, and they object to Jews, whether they're Israeli or American or any other nationality. The, the Palestinians object to having any Jews living within their, their territory. And again, that's the facts, the way I've been able to find them. You know, feel free to, to search it out yourself and see whether you see any other examples. Uh, we know that Israel can live with Arabs because more than 20% of the Israeli population is Arab. We don't know whether Palestinians can live with Jews because in the areas A, A and B of the West Bank and in Gaza, there are no Jews. So those are the areas that Palestinians control. There are no Jews. It's. Uh, I don't understand exactly why the international community thinks in order to reach a solution to the problem, all the Jews have to be removed. And let me let me just say one more thing about it. If you realize that in in 1949, when Jordan conquered East Jerusalem, part of what they conquered was the Jewish quarter of the old city. They've been Jewish for a long, long time. They conquered it in 49. They expelled all the Jews. In 1967, Israel conquered it back. There are many political leaders around the world who insist that that's an illegal settlement by Israel and that the Jewish quarter must once again be ethnically cleansed of Jews. I, I don't understand that, but, but that's part of what they're talking about. So it sounds harsh, maybe it is. All right, I, I, I'll, I'll move on then to is Israel an apartheid state? Because this is the claim we we hear more and more nowadays. You know, it used to be uh, people hated uh, Jews because of their religion, and then uh, in the 20th century because of their race. Now, now it's because of Israel being an apartheid state. And what is that all about? So bring back Danny uh, I alone one more time. Some accuse Israel of being an apartheid state, discriminating against its Arab population. Their conclusion is that it should be sanctioned and boycotted just like South Africa was. 
let's talk about Israel and apartheid. What is apartheid? Apartheid was a system of institutionalized racial segregation and discrimination in effect in South Africa between 1948 and 1991. For example, blacks couldn't vote, be elected, serve as judges, live or even work in white areas without a pass, buy land freely, and they had separate hospitals, public transportation, beaches, public restaurants, schools, and academic institutions. In brief, they were restricted and discriminated against geographically and excluded culturally. Let's see how things are in Israel. All Israeli citizens, whether Jews or Arabs, have an equal vote. Arabs can be elected to office and are in fact the third largest party in the Israeli parliament. Arabs serve as judges, an Arab judge even threw a Jewish president into jail. They share academic institutions, hospitals, transportation, beaches, and all facilities. They live all over the country. They've won national beauty contests and reality shows on Israeli TV. They are on Israel's national sports team. Therefore, it is not surprising that Frederick de Klerk, the South African leader who won a Nobel Peace Prize for ending the apartheid and knows a thing or two about it, said such a comparison is odious and unfair. Okay, so how did this charge of apartheid happen? Um, there were a number of fringe groups who were charging that. And then Human Rights Watch, which is a fairly um, uh, well-respected group, decided to get onto this bandwagon and, and then things really snowballed from there. And how did they do it? They said, no, no, apartheid in South Africa meant that the whites and the blacks were kept apart from each other. That's not what we mean by apartheid. We have a brand new definition of apartheid. We'll still keep calling it apartheid, but it, but it means something totally different. And the reason, in my opinion, they keep calling it apartheid is because the only solution of apartheid is to uh, eliminate the state that was creating the apartheid. So, so what's the new definition? And it's a three-part definition, intent to dominate, systematic oppression and inhumane acts. And boy, I, I've even gone through a lot of material from Human Rights Watch to see how do they come up with saying Israel meets those. And they basically have a couple of techniques that they use. One is lies and distortions. So they'll talk about Jewish only roads that go through the West Bank. In fact, they're not Jewish only roads, they're Israeli only roads that are there for security reasons. Now, the truth is roadblocks and difficulties of travel for the Palestinians is a real important issue. You know, it, it, to take several hours to get to some place that should only take a half hour to do, that's a big problem. I would not characterize it as an inhumane act. So lies and distortions part of it. Another part of it is omissions and double standards. So for example, it is difficult if, if an Israeli marries someone outside the country, how do they bring their spouse into the country? It's a very hard process. It's hard to get approved. That's a terrible thing, in my opinion. However, it's true for many countries in the world. There is no legal obligation to, that you have to bring your spouse allow the spouse to come in. And why did Israel do this? They didn't do it because they wanted to punish the Palestinian population. They did it because there were num numerous examples of terrorist bombers who came into this country through this route and they had to put a stop to it. And there's nothing in the reports from Human Rights Watch that gives any context to why this is happening. So, so you see these techniques used uh, along with a completely changed definition to make the claim that uh, Israel is apartheid. So can Israel do better? Yeah, definitely. Are they apartheid? No. Okay. Any questions on apartheid before I go into the last topic? Okay, COVID vaccines. 
Is Israel obligated to provide vaccines to the Palestinians? Did Israel violate international law? This is the most clear cut of all the topics that I've had so far. Oslo Accords Article 17 is very clear. The Palestinian government is responsible for vaccines. It's right there in the words. Does the Fourth Geneva Convention apply? Well, we've already talked earlier. The way I see things, the way Eugene Kantorovich sees things, there is, it does not apply. However, if it did apply, Article 6 says the occupier's public health obligations expire one year after occupation. And in addition, Article 56 of the Fourth Geneva Convention says the health services of the occupied country, in this case, the Palestinians, is responsible for controlling epidemics. So if the Fourth Geneva Convention did apply, Article 6 and Article 56 says Israel is not responsible, and it's all overridden by Oslo, Article 17. This is all very clearly written down. There can be no claim that Israel's obligated. So how did this thing blow up in such a big way? Because five U.S. senators sent a letter to the Secretary of State that said, quote, Israel's legally obligated to provide for the health and well-being of all people under its control. This comes from Article 56, which says exactly the opposite. And then 12 members of the U.S. House sent a similar letter saying not only they have an obligation to uh, in the West Bank, but also an obligation in the Gaza Strip. So bottom line, we live in a post-truth age where things are easy to look up and, and you can find that uh, even well-respected members of Congress uh, are saying the opposite. And again, it goes back to my very first chart that says, be very suspicious about facts, check them out carefully. Okay. Any, any, any questions on vaccines? Okay, concluding section, I'm gonna summarize. Is Palestine a, a, a state, a country? A complicated, Israel and the US say no. I'm not sure. Are the territories occupied, my opinion? And I think the facts are good here. No, they're part of Israel, according to international law. Are the settlements illegal? No, I really think you have to look in terms of what, what does it mean to require all the Jews to be moved out of an area? Is Israel apartheid? That charge is absurd. Uh, by the way, I have seen other websites, uh, people, I, uh, uh, different organizations I respect also use the word absurd here. Uh, is Israel responsible to vaccinate Palestinians? No, per the Oslo Accords, which is really the ruling document right now. Okay, uh, so I wanted to say thanks for participating. I will take some more questions. Uh, uh, let us know what other Israel topics you want to learn about. You can send an email to adultdad at Uh I will be posting the recording to YouTube. We have a very nice YouTube site, youtube.brithakim.org. Uh, the rabbi mentioned uh, earlier that there are uh, uh, sites you can look at that'll give you different opinions. Um, I mean, uh, camera.org is a particularly good fact-finding site. Again, it has a point of view. It's, it shouldn't be the only place you look. Uh, memory, uh, I think it's memory.org. Yes, CAMERA stands for a Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis, CAMERA.org, like the word camera. Um, MEMORY stands for Middle East Media Research Institute.org. And these are uh, independent organizations. I don't know, I, I, I can't really speak for camera. I don't know much about as much about it as I do memory. But um, basically what they do is they, uh, one of the things they do is they take news reports from different countries and translate those reports into English and okay. other languages as well. So you can see what's being said in different languages around the world and how they sometimes don't always match up. Yeah. And that, that's especially what memory does. Uh, camera really focuses on uh, taking news reports uh, that it feels are incorrect 
and pointing out the mistakes and the facts. And, and they'll do that for Israeli newspapers too, if they're incorrupt. Uh, sometimes in a way that's not favorable to Israel. Uh, they'll point it out if it's not correct. Uh, and there, there are many others. Uh, uh, UN Watch is one that I think is is good. And, um, and, and it's very easy to find uh, websites that are, uh, that will definitely give you an anti-Israel point of view. Um, many of them out there. Okay, so any any other questions as we're wrapping up? Just a, 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 a one more reminder to uh, to really make sure that you know when you when you see information, do your own research as well. These two organizations we mentioned, there are other sites out there. Really, you know, make sure you're not getting your news from one source. Make sure you're not reading only one paper. You're not watching only one station. You're not listening to only one radio station. There's lots of stuff out that. Aries, you want to come and ask your question? We have a, a question from the peanut gallery. I mean, from the ninth and tenth graders. Hi. Would the U.S. when it had like the Jim Crow laws be considered an apartheid? Yes, I would say yes. Right. That's clearly separation according to racial racial divisions. Yeah, good question. Those are the kinds of things to think about because we don't want to just take them for granted. Yeah. Here's a question and, for someone you may know. Yeah, but what's weird is the UN, um, the Human Rights Watch, who's a, one of the big accusers now, they say, yeah, Israel's apartheid, but they're not like South Africa at all. It's totally different rationale. They're just trying to reuse a word which everybody knows means is evil. Mark, it's Rhonda. Yeah. I have a question about the vaccinations. Yeah. Did Israel offer to do any vaccinations of the Arab areas? So, so the answer is yes and no. Um, so at the time that this charge was being made, Israel was acquiring enough vaccines for its own people. And so they insisted that they wanted to make sure that their own Israeli citizens were taken care of before others were taken care of. And then uh, after that, uh, since they paid for the vaccines, they offered to sell vaccines to the Palestinians. And the Palestinians, uh, I know initially, turned down their first offer. I don't think they ever accepted an offer from the Israelis to to sell vac to, to buy vaccines. I, I think that they prefer to buy them from other countries. And, and, yeah. Does anybody else have any other questions? I was just going to say, I'm oh, so I'll just, I'll, and then I'll give it back to you. That's fine. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Rabbi in a minute. I just want to um, thank everybody for coming and let you know that the next adult ed program is a week from Tuesday night, seven o'clock. A little bit different. It's about Andy Warhol and the uh, Jewish geniuses. It's about it's uh, about art. So totally different, maybe a little less controversial. And um, there's lots of snacks in the back, so make sure you take something on the way out. And I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi to wrap things up. Yeah, Thank you, Cheryl. I, I, I just want one, one more reminder for me of, I, I'm not suggesting in this talk what Israel should do, what the Palestinians should do going forward. But I just talked about some history that I thought was interesting. and. How to, how to look at some claims that are being made about Israel. Right. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm not actually in a position to wrap things up, but I just wanted to just share a personal uh, experience. Some of you have heard the story when I was in uh, Israel for rabbinical school, the first year of the rabbinical program is uh, 
um, is uh, is at the campus in Jerusalem. And so um, the uh, a friend of mine was working for the UN at the time in Jerusalem, working on uh, for an organization, I think it's called for Defense for Children International or Children's Defense International, uh, addressing uh, under under resourced areas of the world when it comes to child health care, uh, not medical care, not health care, medical care. So it was really about uh, not insurance or anything. It was about access to literally medical care. And so um, I'm sitting in her office uh, this one day and she said, uh, hey, Eric, you want to go to Gaza? And I was like, sure, I'll go to Gaza. And so she was putting together this conference in Jerusalem, medical professionals from around the world, pediatricians. And um, and she uh, uh, she had, there were like five multi-degree medical professionals in me. Uh, we got into this cab and went down to uh, the border of the Gaza Strip. Cab dropped us off. We went in. We were met by uh, by uh, members of the Palestinian Authority, by uh, UN officials. We were on this big, huge white school bus with big black letters that said UNRWA, United Nations Relief Workers Association. And we traveled around and we met with pediatricians and local people. And um, it was really a, an eye-opening experience. One of the things that struck me, and again, this is you know 30 years ago, so things can change for sure. But we uh, uh, we drove through one of the refugee camps uh, in Gaza, and we saw the squalor in which all of these people were living. And then, uh, and, and had I not seen this with my own eyes, I don't know that I would have believed it myself, uh, but we got to the exit of the refugee camp and literally drove directly across the street into the parking lot of the five-star hotel where they served us lunch. And um, it was just interesting to see the the dichotomy in terms of, uh, you know, the people who are in charge and the people who are living there and how those things play themselves out. And there's lots of reasons for that and lots of, uh, you know, um, lots of uh, uh, explanations and circumstances and all kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, it just it's just very it was troubling to see. And so uh, that's why I always say, you know, just because that's that that was the case when I was on that bus seeing it with my own eyes doesn't mean that that's still the case and it doesn't mean that there's that uh, that there's one particular reason why that happens but there's lots of stuff going on out there we don't know it all we don't see it all if there really were one answer uh, we'd have a fact sheet we'd all read it and we go oh that's the reason <laughs> right but it's not and so we really have to do our best to kind of understand what's uh, what's really going on. Um, one of the things you may know or you may not know is that in Israel in the hospitals in the in the uh, uh, pediatric units uh, they you know how like if you've ever been in a hospital room they have TVs with for you know you can get cable and stuff they provide educational uh, um, uh, the curriculum from whatever school they they provide education while you're in the hospital so you don't miss school per se. I mean, it's really uh, interesting. And so even when, you know, like the, uh, when Syria was being, uh, was uh, being attacked, however long ago, there was something going on and Syrian children were being brought over into Israel uh, to be uh, taken care of in uh, hospitals in the North. And they were given this opportunity to, you know, everybody in the hospital anyway, to have uh, education. So, uh, but there are lots of things that are, you know, no one's blameless. I think that's important to remember, and uh, there are lots of lots of uh, opportunities for us to get all sorts of information uh, from different perspectives. So that's really important. Thank you, Robin. All right, I'm going to end it. Can... One yes? second, Mark. This is Sharon. Yeah. Um, I just particularly want to highlight for our students that. Some of you are closer to college than others, but you're a few years away from college. And one of the things about college is the opportunity to hear about, learn about all kinds of things. One of the things that is particularly, I think, eye-opening for many of our students is how Israel is perceived and some of the information that you will hear about Israel. and negative perspectives of Israel. Now, we all have our own political positions about what happens in the United States. There are multiple sides to every issue. 
in Israel, there are multiple sides to every issue. I particularly want to highlight for you guys that as you hear things about Israel, you may often be put in a position where you feel like you're on the defensive. And one of the things that really helps with that is the more information that you have to be looking into and understanding, as we did today, what these things mean and the things that you're going to hear so that you can honestly respond or that it's okay to say, I don't know, but I want to get back to you on that and to be able, but to be prepared for, for that. And that it's okay to disagree. You don't have to agree with everything that Israel does. Um, there's something important. However, we do need to keep in mind our history and the importance of Israel to us, and therefore our responsibility, I guess, to, to be able to stand up for Israel, acknowledging where it's not right, but be able to stand up and say is the importance of our having Israel. Good point. Wait. Wait, you still there? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up now. So I want to thank everybody for coming. And I know we had some people online too. Um, I want to thank Mark for putting together this pro program about it. Oh, you're getting applause <laughs> on a, a, a difficult and um, challenging set of topics. I want to remind you about the snacks out there, uh, or in the back, I should say, for those of you who are here. And uh, thanks, Cheryl, once again. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.